maybe a word or two to answer the question that you folks have about where is Alex? He's not sick, okay? Uh, a couple of weeks ago, at least when Alex asked if I was going to be available so I could preach today, he indicated that he was planning to be on a spiritual retreat for a couple of days. So uh, while he's not sick, he is about the business of renewing himself. So uh, pray for him while he's in retreat and uh, be ready for him when he comes back. Because when I talked to him last, he, he wished me well and asked that I preach a good sermon. And I said, well, I'll do my best to make sure that everybody's happy to see you when you come back. <laughs> I hope it's not that bad, but join me with a word of prayer. Gracious Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight this day to the glory of Christ's kingdom. Amen. I don't know if you have picked up on the beginning of some of Alex's sermons, but there are times when Alex finds scripture to be challenging. And uh, maybe I'm naive. I'm not challenged by some of the same passages he is, but lo and behold, as I'm here to stand before you today, this is one of the passages that I find challenging. I begin by wondering why in the world would this guy Jesus, who never put himself out there to be adored or worshipped, you know, this man Jesus who went from place to place teaching, healing, and often leaving the message as is in the passage, don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. The time's not right yet. Why would Jesus pick three of his disciples, not all 12? You know, we're taught not to show favoritism, right? Why would he pick three of his disciples and take them up on the mountain and be transfigured and all of a sudden seen there with two of the biggest people of Jewish history? Moses and Elijah. What's he trying to get across? You know, is he the next Moses? Is he the new Elijah? What was the point of him standing there in the glow of this mysterious light? Was it just the way the sun reflected off of them? Or was he somehow different? That Moses and Elijah and Jesus should be having this conversation while these three disciples were looking on. It makes no sense to me. It doesn't fit with my picture of who Jesus was. But then still there had to be a reason. Why would the people put it in the gospel? Why would it be there for us to read today, thousands of years later? And I wonder, was it for Jesus to make an announcement? Or was it for God to have the opportunity to remind these three disciples, hey, I've given this message once before. You know, the, the, the phrase about, this is my beloved son. Do you remember where you heard that before? When Jesus went down to the Jordan River to be baptized by John, and he comes up out of the water, and the skies open up, and the dove descends, and what does God say? 
This is my beloved son with whom I am pleased. Listen to him. I do think there are some lessons there for us also to learn. When we see the response of those disciples, what was their first reaction? You know, they'd seen this glowing light around Jesus and Moses and Elijah, and the first reaction is, let's build a temple. Let's mark this place. That was a big part of Jewish history and life. When significant events happened, they often marked that place to leave it with a sense of being sacred. Many times all it was was just a pile of stones. But marking that something for we, the Jewish people, something significant happened here. In our culture, we build monuments. My brother stopped by last night, stayed overnight, and then left early this morning to go celebrate his grandchildren's birthday. Uh, but he has this thing. He travels the country to visit historical sites. And almost always he comes away with pictures of monuments. It's our way in this culture of doing what the Jews did is marking their Ebenezer. Remember that hymn? The Ebenezer is piling the stones to mark the place as well as the occasion. That was the, the first reaction of the disciples. Well and good, I believe. Those are important things for us to be remembering and marking in our life. And I've had any number of occasions in my own life where, you know, this was this was special. It warmed my heart. It lifted my spirits. But then the temptation is to stay there. The temptation is also to leave God there. Since I won't be preaching to you on Good Friday or Easter Sunday, I'll get to share this little piece. One of the most significant pieces of the story of Christ's death on the cross, right before Easter on that Good Friday, is that the curtain to the Holy of Holies inside the temple was torn from top to bottom. And I think there's some significance to that in that for the Jewish people, that's where God lived. And if you go back to the story before the story of Jesus being born, John the Baptist's dad, you know, was drawn by Lot to go into that place where God lived. For the Jews, God was scary, awesome, powerful. But they kept God wrapped into this holy of holies in the temple. But when Jesus died, that temple curtain was torn, top to bottom, and God was freed to be in and with his people. We have a tendency to create monuments and shrines, and that's what happened that day. But as the story goes on, Jesus reminds the disciples that we got to go back down into the valley. We've got to go back down into the valley where the world is. But I think hidden in that message is also the message that, yes, I'm up here on the temple with Moses and Elijah, but I'm also down there in the valley with the people. 
who are living their everyday lives trying to be faithful disciples. We don't lock God off on the mountaintop. We bring God down into the valley with us. He's here with us now. When we're dealing with illness, when we're dealing with grief, when we're dealing with a world that seems to be torn apart by hatred, when we deal with all those temptations to forget that God is here too. Wednesday, for those of us in our tradition, marks the beginning of the season we call Lent. There's been a lot made this year about the fact that, that Ash Wednesday falls on Valentine's Day and Easter on April Fool's Day. Don't know if that's coincidence or a, a good theological word, providence. Is there a hidden message in that? I don't know. But that's the way it happens this year. Lent for us is a season for or has been a season for us to, to repent, cast away our old ways and our old forms and give up on sin to be the righteous people that God has called us to be. I believe that part of the reason, at least, that Christ took those disciples to the mountaintop was not just so that Jesus could transfigure and be, you know, shining white light and be clearly associated with the real historical figures of the faith. It was for, for those disciples to begin their own transformation process. Jesus knows where he's headed. He's headed to the cross. Jesus knows there's a day when these disciples who are going to be all that he leaves behind on earth to carry on his task. They're going to need be transformed. Now we live in a culture that makes us, well, makes it difficult for us to understand what it means to be transformed. On the one hand, we like to think of it as it's something that happened at one instant, there and then, when in truth, transformation for us is a lifelong discipleship journey. We live in a culture where, you know, we're rewarded for what we do. But for us, the transfer, transformation process is less about what we do and more about what we can give up. And I'm not talking about giving up chocolate. It's more about how we can give up our need to be in control, our need to take charge, our need to drive things, and to let God. That 40 days of Lent is a time for us to try to connect with the God that, that we worship the God that we serve. And we don't do it so much by doing more things or doing better things or even doing different things. We do it more by stepping back and trying to give up this head of ours that wants to control and drive everything and to let God in. 
unless something's changed since the last time I attended a staff meeting, during Lent, you're going to have an opportunity to learn some spiritual disciplines in a Sunday morning Sunday school class. But even better yet, you're going to have an opportunity to uh, practice some of those disciplines with Alex or Steve. There'll be little groups that will be gathering with them to do uh, primarily contemplative prayer. The Sunday school class is going to talk about a, a variety of dis different disciplines, but, but the whole concept of contemplative prayer is trying to let go of our need to control so that God can, can be there and lead us and guide us. And let me tell you, in my efforts, that's not as easy to do as you might think. We as Presbyterians believe that we could not say the words, Jesus is Lord, if it weren't for the fact that the Spirit of God is already inside of us leading us to say those words. We cannot believe that Jesus is Lord unless God's Spirit is infusing us in such a way that we believe and we have faith. Maybe we need to see Jesus on the mountaintop, a glow. Or maybe there are others of us who need to see Jesus in the people who are feeding the hungry, or maybe even seeing Jesus in the hungry and homeless person who comes to be fed. Look for him. Look for him. On the top of the mountain, and the person sitting next to you in the pew. And the person who wouldn't enter the doors of this church if you asked them to. Look for him in that homeless person living in a little tent down by the shelter. who is so proud of his dog that he wants everybody to meet him. Changes our, I think, our perspective on the world when we start to see God in each other. And when we start to let God live through us. We're running a season of, of transformation possibilities. I'm going to say, I'm going to speak words out of both sides of my mouth. Work at it, but may your work be such that you don't try too hard. There's a phrase in some of the spiritual disciplines of let go and let God. Let God transform you into the disciple that he's called you to be. Amen.